on to the next talk on Transplant Pregnancy Registry International and overview and how India can partner. May I invite the speaker, Dr. Lisa Ekoskia. I'd like to invite the chairpersons for this talk, Dr. Om Kumar, Dr. Sanjeev Gulati and Dr. Edwin Fernando. Over to the chairpersons. Good morning uh, all. Uh, on, on behalf of the, my co-chairpersons, Dr. Om Kumar and Sanjeev Gulati, we welcome uh, Dr. Lissi. Uh, she's a transplant nurse. Uh, her uh, CV runs into several pages. She's been a transplant nurse, a transplant coordinator, now heads the International Transplant Registry. And uh, we shall listen to her as to how India could partner this registry. So can we have the talk? Is it a recording or live? So it's a recording. The kidney from her identical yes. twin sister. Yes. That pregnancy was something that could happen and does happen. So the recipient went on to have two live births and her donor went on to have four live births. And the issues were a little bit different back then because the recipient was not on any immunosuppression. So we know um, though that um, pregnancy can and does happen after transplant. So the Transplant Pregnancy Registry International is a voluntary pregnancy registry which has been collecting pregnancy information for over 30 years. It started in January of 1991 as the National Transplantation Pregnancy Registry and was established to study the outcomes of pregnancy after transplantation in North America. And with the help of Gift of Life Donor Program and Gift of Life Institute, where we're now housed, in October of 2016, the NTPR was changed to the Transplant Pregnancy Registry International, and we now include pregnancy outcomes worldwide. We have a very simple multi-pronged IRB approved method for data collection, which includes informed consent from the recipient, a telephone interview if someone's from North America, um, or we have an online questionnaire for those outside of North America. And we do review medical records when possible and interview healthcare providers. And we also do long-term follow-up interviews to monitor recipient and offspring health. This occurs every two years after a patient enrolls with us. So one of my favorite slides is um, our world map and it shows um, where everybody's from. And we actually do have one recipient who's reported from India. And I really think there's an opportunity here to partner with uh, everyone in India. We know that you do so many transplants and we could really look at the outcomes for um, your country as well. Because once we have more um, information, it would be something um, to do where we could look at country outcomes and see if there's any differences or, from across the world. But we do have people from all across the world, which has been very exciting. So as of um, the end of August, um, we have uh, over 2,700 recipients, um, or 2,900 recipients, 2,700 from North America in the United States. So um, this is very exciting. And I want you to uh, take a look at um, kind of the more specifics. We collect outcomes on all different types of organ transplant recipients. And if you'll notice here, the number of outcomes, this is outcomes over here, are greater than the number of pregnancies because patients do have twins and triplets after um, transplant. And the number of pregnancies is greater than the number of recipients because patients do have more than one and with stable graph function do very well. I also want to mention that we do collect outcomes on fathered pregnancies as well. And this was very helpful, as you'll see a little bit later on with the mycophenolate issue. So what are the um, kind of general recommendations for immunosuppression? Generally considered safe are our uh, calcineurin inhibitors and prednisone and azathioprine. We know that mycophenolate mofetil and mycophenolic acid or MPA as I'll be referring to them throughout this presentation are contraindicated during pregnancy for a female recipient. We really just don't have enough information on bilatacept, sirolimus and everolimus. So how did um, we come to the conclusion with 
uh, MPA exposure being contraindicated during pregnancy. Well, what we saw when we pulled out those outcomes and looked at them with MPA exposure versus no exposure is an increased risk of miscarriage and also a specific pattern of birth defect with a cleft lip, palate, and um, a condition called microtia, which is a malformed ear or absence of the ear. So this percentage here um, of over 50% for a non-viable outcome is much higher than we ever saw in the registry. So that was um, a clue. And also this was um, based on um, outcomes from the literature as well. But, and then there was this increase and an increase incidence and pattern of malformation that we saw in the birth defects. So pregnancies with exposure to MPA are associated with higher incidences of miscarriage and birth defects, including a specific pattern. And it's really because we had that historical data to compare to with no MPA outcomes that really helped us look at that. And that's what we always have that um, available for the future if there are other medications that are uh, developed for transplant patients. So we have a multitude of information that we can send to patients, to healthcare providers. We, were, we have worked on patient-focused uh, brochures. We, we publish an annual report every year, and we also publish in medical journals that is available to anyone. And I'm happy to send any kind of information um, to anyone around the world. So here's our outcomes. As you can see, kidney is the largest cohort. We know that's the most commonly transplanted organ. We have outcomes from all the way back to 1967 um, in kidney, on 1985 in liver, and 1989 in kidney pancreas. And most of our patients wait that required one year um, after transplant in order to become pregnant. The number I'd really see, like to see go down even more is this unplanned pregnancy. Many of our patients don't know they can become pregnant or don't use effective birth control after their transplant. So that's something that's really important because um, in past uh, registry uh, analyses, we've seen that a planned pregnancy does confer better graft outcomes. We see a high percentage of hypertension during pregnancy in our kidney recipients, um, not as much in liver, and about the same in kidney pancreas. Um, the pancreas is able to uh, maintain uh, the insulin production for pregnancy, and only one, one or two patients required insulin use because of high dose steroids during pregnancy. We do see a high percentage of preeclampsia overall in the U.S. population. This is around usually um, in the general population. It's around three to five percent, and this is much higher than we see in the general population. And also, we do see um, some rejection. However, this is all types of rejection, and especially in kidney recipients, some patients may have had some graft dysfunction or chronic rejection prior to their pregnancy. And we do see some graft loss within two years of delivery, but really um, not any higher than you would expect in someone who's probably um, almost uh, seven to 10 years after their uh, transplant. And how about the kids? What do the kids look like? So out of the live births, we usually see that the babies are born about four weeks early. Um, a little bit closer to term for liver recipients and a little bit smaller in kidney pancreas recipients. So they really um, do well um, despite the um, uh, low birth weight and prematurity. Uh, we do see a high percentage of cesarean section deliveries though. So they really, um, even though despite um, our recommendation that uh, cesarean section be for obstetric reasons only, that um, they uh, do still have a high percent of cesarean sections. And overall, the birth de defect rate is similar to that of the US general population, which is between three and 5%. 
So I mentioned that we do follow outcomes for uh, fathers as well. And we looked at um, those exposed to MPA and those outcomes not exposed to MPA. And there were no statistical differences between the two. So this is really helpful because early on, I got a lot of questions asking, do men have to stop their mycophenolate prior to uh, fathering a pregnancy? And the answer is really no. We have not seen any differences though, from with the live birth rate, with the gestational ages, with the birth weights and the birth defects um, are, are the, the same. So really, and overall, if you look at the outcomes for fathered pregnancies, we really see very minimal differences or, or really none compared to the, to the US general population. Their mean gestational ages are right at term. The babies are um, uh, good birth weights. We see no increase in any birth defects. And this has been the same overall um, with uh, our outcomes since the beginning of the registry back in 1991. So uh, fathered pregnancy outcomes do look um, very similar to the general population. So <clears throat> in conclusion, Recipients of childbearing age should be counseled regarding the feasibility and timing of pregnancy after transplantation. I think it's imperative that we let um, women of childbearing age know that they can um, become pregnant and that they should use effective birth control if they do not want to become a parent after their transplant. Um, pregnancy and maternal outcomes really vary based on multiple factors, especially on the type of organ transplanted. You saw that with kidney pancreas patients, their babies are much smaller than those of liver and kidney recipients. And pre-pregnancy graft function is really important because we know a pregnancy, if someone has some graft problems with chronic rejection, it's not going to get better during pregnancy. And really their comorbidities should be uh, under control. So if they have hypertension or diabetes, really make sure they're on the right medication uh, to control those uh, comorbidities prior to a pregnancy. All of these pregnancies are considered high risk with increased incidences of hypertension, preeclampsia and prematurity. So really they need close monitoring by uh, a, obstetricians specializing in high-risk pregnancies. And really, they need to also be managed by a multidisciplinary team. We see uh, medication dosages change during pregnancy, and they really need to be followed by their transplant doctor very closely as well. So we really want to serve as a resource for recipients and their healthcare providers when making family planning decisions. We have an annual report that has all of the, these data that I just presented. Every year we write this um, and it's available um, by request um, through the TPRI. I, either myself or another nurse responds to all of our requests. And we really want to partner with um, everyone around the world to get this information out to recipients, because it's really important that they have the best information available to make a um, parenthood decision um, after their transplant. And <clears throat> here's our contact information. I'm very sorry I can't um, be with you at the conference today. Um, the time change was a little bit difficult, but if anyone has any questions, um, patients can register right online. There is a tab on our website that says how to register. So um, patients can click on that. It's a very short form. It just has some demographic information. And then if they've already had a pregnancy, we send them an additional questionnaire to fill out with, with asking some details about their pregnancy. So we think it's really important um, for centers worldwide to participate. And I'm happy to talk with anyone um, who has any additional questions or give a longer presentation um, uh, more about the registry um, at any time. Uh, especially with Zoom now, it's really easy to uh, talk to people um, all over the world. So I really appreciate your time and thank you for the opportunity to present these data. Yeah, I think that was a fascinating talk by Lisa on uh, 
pregnancy after kidney transplantation i think it's one of the most fascinating aspects and also perhaps one of the most challenging case scenarios and it i think it presents a great opportunity for the indian society of organ transplantation to to partner and uh, get data and i think in time what we lack right now is uh, you know models for risk production uh, prediction something on the lines which uh, dori cgf has uh, published in, in kidney transplantation and once we have a wider database i'm sure such models will be forthcoming and they'll be very useful for the practicing clinician to put an accurate number there as to the risk you know many a times uh, it, while we counsel our patients in our day to day practice uh, the the risk reduction uh, prediction you know become becomes an issue uh, i think lisa is not there to but there there are any questions you know they, we have a panel edwin and om kumar all three of us will be happy to take some questions and uh, you can also email these some of these uh, questions to lisa the email has already been given i agree that now we can have a possible safe pregnancies in transplant recipients i don't know whether she is uh, here to answer our questions have she uh, uh, analyzed the pregnancy outcome in when the both parents are transplant recipients versus when single parent is the transplant recipient i think om she is uh, this was a recorded talk so okay. yeah this, she wouldn't be able to answer the question so I, right? think, i think that's a very interesting question that you brought out as to what is the additive risk if uh, you know uh, and in in times to come i'm sure we'll be seeing more and more such um, families where the, both the parents are uh, perhaps transplant patients and also the time period is uh, earlier on i remember when we started the transplant program that cut off was 2 years but the bar has now been lowered to 1 year 1 year and um, why 1 year is it it's just a number if 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 everything is going safe i don't know um can we do it earlier 9 months 6 months um, so that's another area of research and uh, are are we having a registry of transplant uh, pregnancy patients in isot like tpri in india no as of now no but i think this uh, the uh, i will this talk itself should stimulate the isot at least yeah. uh, to set up at least an indian registry which can you know um, to partner with uh, with the uh, international transplant uh, international registry at least the indian data needs to be there you are right as of now we don't have but uh, i think this should stimulate all of us to put our minds together and collect it, collect data uh, I, I hope Vivek Kutte is here and he's listening. Our, you know, secretary. energetic secretary. secretary. Yeah. Yes, definitely. And we've got a new executive here, so uh, I think this is uh, this should be something that we all should put our minds to. We are running oh, we short of time. May I request the chairpersons yeah. to conclude the session? Thank you very much. Yeah, I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting. all of us here for this exciting talk and as you can see already we put our minds the we have set ourselves thinking as to how to start an uh, national registry of the pregnancy in india and it's a great opportunity to partner with the international registry thank you once again on behalf of all my co-chairs thank you thank you thank you thank you chairpersons Bye -bye.